So, um, yeah, I guess next is my lecture. So, once again, obviously that was stressed quite often, but uh, thanks a lot for inviting me once again to this meeting. Uh, you really managed to um, not only maintain, but make a great course even greater. Uh, it's really remarkable how you can do this each and every time. Um, pleasure to be here, actually, and to meet with the faculty and see everyone. It's really great. So, um, I was asked to this time speak about JLCA, JLO, so Joint Line Obliquity. Um, effect, how that affects my planning and uh, talk a bit uh, about the scientific background. Obviously, they wanted me to uh, speak directly before the lunch break because they knew that I would run out of time anyhow. So, these are my disclosures. Um, talking about joint line obliquity and, um, and alignment overall, uh, to me, actually, is strongly linked with the name Johan Mikulic. Johan Mikulic, I mean, he would deserve several lectures about himself alone, and uh, it's really remarkable. Um, this is uh, an excerpt of his thesis paper, actually, that he uh, uh, did some 150 years ago. And in this paper, he does not only describe the direction line, the so-called Mikulic line, the connection from the um, proximal joint center of the femur to the uh, distal joint center of the tibia. He also described the knee basis line, which is the so-called joint line that describes the joint line obliquity. And in contrast to Paley, he described the lateral, uh, uh, the lateral distal femur angle, but uh, uh, at the tibial side, he described equally the lateral proximal tibia angle. But that doesn't change anything. He comes to the same values. Uh, down there, you see actually the table um, where he summed up all the values from the 100 specimens that he checked. And well, this is all in German and therefore tricky. So I translated that for you. And here it goes. So he found that the knee base is not perpendicular to the mechanical axis, um, mechanical femoral axis, but forms an uh, outwardly open non-constant angle from 89 to 85, averaging at 87. So this is exactly what we found 150 or confirmed 150 years later. And for the tibial uh, side, the thought angle is actually the complement to 180 degrees and therefore the same on the other side, which leads us to exactly what uh, was confirmed later, 87 uh, for the MLDFA and somewhat 87 for the MPTA. And so uh, this is nothing new. Actually, it has been around for always. So now, if we know about alignment and look at this Mikulic line, where to put now the correction? Well, we have a couple of studies, and obviously this is now strongly linked to the name Fujisawa. So Fujisawa, in fact, he did not really describe a point, but rather an area uh, where, at least for his patients, he found it to be preferential to put the intersection point. And he said that this has to be somewhat 30 till 40 percent of the lateral compartment, which in fact translated to the nomenclature where you look over the whole tibial plateau width is rather 65 to 70 percent of the tibial plateau width, which is obviously quite far to the lateral side. And if you want to come that far to the lateral side, then sometimes you have to compromise because the uh, osteotomies actually need to be quite big. And for these huge osteotomy uh, changes, um, either from the medial or from the lateral side, as you see it here in this publication, actually you create something which is a abnormality in itself. So this is somewhat what we call a palliative surgery. So in this respect of the joint line orientation, you sacrifice the JLO just for the sake of the Mikulic line. In his uh, remarkable paper, actually, that he published in 77, um, he, uh, and when you look at the reference list, he cites Mikulic paper 150 years ago, so which was exclusively written in German. I don't know whether he was back in Japan, capable of some translation, but I think that's remarkable. So nonetheless, as we said, 70% tibial plateau width to the lateral side is quite far. Dr. Illinois actually empirically found that uh, this may be too far and went rather to 62%. And this is actually where we find the 62% the first time. So 62 to 66. In fact, this is not what Fujisawa claimed. So nonetheless, there is not, not a real scientific proof for this, as this is what was just empirically found. So nonetheless, we need to defy 
where to put the correction because uh, actually Mikulic line only tells us that there is an overall malalignment. It does not really tell us where it's originated. So we need to perform a proper analysis of the malalignment to see whether it's rather at the femur or at the tibia or maybe somewhere else. So respectively, uh, respectively we, we just checked in Hanover 2014 retrospectively what, uh, what we had done in our almost 340 osteotomies of that year and we found that 20% of the, uh, of the malalignments were well originally in the femur but we only operated in 1% of our osteotomies at the femoral side so in fact we operated 19% of our patients at the wrong bone so and this is basically when we started to do proper analysis of our alignments. So once again, if you have the joint line obliquity and you just look at the Mikulic line and correct the tibia, then you may overdo it completely and you end up at something uh, like an empty MPTA of, a 100, of 100 degrees. So when you do this, you create these patients. So this is one of our early uh, patients uh, with an MLDFA of 101 degrees and an MPTA of 88. So in fact, the malalignment was not in the tibia at all, but because it was a varus deformity, we just did it at the tibial side. And these patients, well, they don't like it and they deteriorate quickly. And actually, these are the ones that you have to convert early. And when you do it, these are the tricky surgeries because you changed anatomy. So deformity analysis is key. And only then you find out where to put your correction and actually how to put your correction to, de uh, to maintain the joint line obliquity because we need it. So when we look at, uh, at gait, then in bipedal stands, as said yesterday, it's completely uninteresting uh, um, uh, how much load is on your knee because it's distributed to both limbs. But when you walk, jump, run, hike, actually then you have five times your body weight on one limb and there you medialize it because to, to balance, you need to put it under the center of mass to gain some balance. This is just to, to cover gravity here. So, and what happens when you medialize your foot actually is you horizontalize an oblique joint line. So a joint line has to be oblique to be horizontal when it counts. So in fact, an oblique joint line is normal. So now looking at only Mikulic line again and seeing a Mikulic line that does not intersect the knee, so you have two options to correct it. So you could do it on a single level, or you could do it on a, in a double level osteotomy, like here. And one is disrespecting, and the other one respects joint line obliquity. So once again, it's very important to not just look at the Mikulic line correction, but also at the um, obliquity of the joint that you create. So. Looking at this now, this is also remarkable work because Tadahiko Kawai uh, was kind of uh, one of the forefathers of finite elemental analysis. And he is a, he's working mainly in, uh, in car uh, engineering and um, still working at uh, University of Tokyo. So, and to do this, he, he had the concept of rigid spring models. And actually, this is probably the reason when you look at these charts here why orthopedic surgeons don't go for mechanics because we cannot understand this but um, there was a guy that could and that was Edmond Chao and he was a bioengineer in the Mayo Clinic so he thought well if there is such a nice finite elemental uh, idea then I can just transfer and and bring this over to a rigid bony spring model and that's what he actually did. So he, um, he constructed this spring model and measured all the forces around the joint and fed it into a computerized software system called OASIS. And that was the first artificial intelligence program that actually taught us where to put our corrections. And Babis back then, Georgios Babis, was a guy from, uh, from Greece. Yes, you're, you're right, he was from Greece. So, um, and he actually thought, well, uh, if my bioengineer has a software that knows better than I where to put my correction and how to do it, then I just use the data that I obtained from the software and perform the surgeries alike. And he actually, based on this, published the best ever published osteotomy midterm results uh, that we have in literature. And this is the um, follow-up paper from him. And here you see 
the deterioration of the results, obviously, over time. But when you look closely at it, and if you follow exclusively the patients that um, are within uh, the threshold of correction that he hypothesized, uh, a proper mycolage alignment plus um, a joint line obliquity, which is within normal means of four degrees, which was allowed as his thres uh, threshold, then actually you see the upper line there. So all these patients remain very stable in their clinical outcome, and all the others that are outliers actually create the dropouts. So there is other modern publications like this one from Nakayama and Stefan Schröter. So they looked into um, also a finite elemental uh, model and checked whether joint line obliquity changes really affect uh, pressure within the joint. And they found that excessive uh, joint line obliquity causes rather uh, peak load areas close to the spine. And uh, our fellow uh, co-speaker, um, um, along with Andrew Amos, Andy Williams pub pub uh, published this paper. Uh, I guess it's a quite recent one. Huh? So uh, this is also remarkable um, because it was somewhat a bit a similar model to look whether uh, um, joint line obliquity changes um, affect the peak load areas, the load on the meniscals, and the overall pressure. So, and the subluxation. So what they found is there is subluxation, there is peak loads at the spines, and there is uh, peak load areas over the menisci, where, whether there is no real overall uh, um, um, load um, or overload on the, on the joint. But nonetheless, obviously, if you distribute the load to maximum peak load, peak load areas, then that has to have a, a consequence for the joint. So we have learned from this that first, not all the deformities can be addressed at the tibial level. Um, we need to look uh, at, the, at the femur as well, and obviously we need to look uh, into the orientation of the joint line. Because once again, if you create something like this, that just is abnormal anatomy, and you need to respect the joint line obliquity, other uh, you contradict uh, biomechanics. So now, what is it with a joint line convergence angle? So that's a funny thing to tackle, actually, because it has nothing to do with bone. So as I said, malalignment can be in the femur, or it can be in the tibia, or in both, or maybe in none of them, because it could also be the joint line convergence angle. So this is from another talk about, uh, about unicondial knee replacement, but it fits here. So in fact, a metaphysial deformity is the number one indication for an osteotomy, because nothing is more normal than correcting something which is abnormal to something which is normal. <laughs> so, and here you have the situation that the malalignment is actually within the joint. So it's an intra-articular deformity that we see. And here, the treatment of choice would actually be unicondylar replacement. So, in fact, we see that this intra-articular deformity now has a consequence because it adds to our overall deformity that we see. And therefore, we have to take this into account if we don't do this and just go for the values that we have and want to bring Mikulic that, as I said, does not respect the individual measurements to a certain intersection point at the level of the tibia, then we will just not detect that this joint line um, uh, situ or the wear and tear which is expressed by the joint line convergence angle will have an effect, an, an, an uh, additional effect on our correction. So once again, Dr. Illinois thought about the same and came with this formula. And the formula is great, but it's very complex and hard to understand. So they, uh, by very complex uh, uh, mathematical equations, found a constant formula of 76.4 divided by the tibial plateau width. And this leads to a correction uh, angle alpha, well, 70, uh, uh, 76.4. Uh, divided by the tibial plateau width, most commonly is one on either side. So you just can't forget about that. And what, what you are left then with is actually the millimeters um, of, the, uh, of the joint space in relation to the non-affected side. So you need an X-ray from the contralateral side. 
you can hear already, this is very complex and uh, I just don't uh, recommend this procedure like this. So what is more intuitive is if you just take the measured joint line convergence angle, in this case as an example 8, and you say a normal JLCA is 2 degrees, well then you just form a range. So you are at 8 and you want to be at 2. So the range is probably 6. And you come to this range by just subtracting from the measure JLCA 2. So you just subtract JLCA minus 2 and then you have the range, which is 6 in this example. Now there is a likelihood of over anticipating this joint space correction that automatically occurs after an osteotomy or to over anticipate it. But there is a way of minimizing your error under a bell curve. And the way to do this is to just divide it by two. So in fact, what you have to do is, as a rule of thumb, take your JLCA, subtract two and divide it by two. So the correction in this example would be three degrees. And this is what you have to subtract from your osteotomy value, not to actually run into the dilemma of creating an overcorrection. I know this is complex as osteotomy always is. Nonetheless, you come up with such a result at the very end. And obviously I've chosen this image because it's debatable looking at the medial, uh, at the medial uh, compartment. But we will see that later in live surgery. Once again, I have the privilege to work in London as well with these guys uh, whom uh, we have presented already. And uh, you've seen Rackbeer already performing this beautiful surgery. So if you want to visit us, you're welcome, obviously. And this is the end of the lecture. Thank you.